Great. Uh, so welcome to today's session called Faculty for OER, an interactive panel discussion. We are, this is put on uh, regularly by the Community College Consortium for OER. We're part of Open Education Global. We offer professional development monthly webinars where we try to highlight best practices and emerging trends based on what the community is asking for. Uh, there is a listserv in which you can stay connected and informed and you can share events, resources, et cetera. And it's a really great opportunities for members to make connections and facilitate project collaborations and to find partnerships to engage in the community through advocacy and projects. Uh, my name is Kimberly Carter. I'm the OER consultant and I manage the open learning team at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And I would like to offer each of my panelists today who are joining us to introduce themselves. Let's start with Larissa. Hi, my name is Larissa Conley, and I am a professor in the Interdisciplinary Studies program at Conestoga College, where Kim is as well. Um, I teach English for academic purposes. So these are my students are um, improving their English so that they can later study in another college program. I have created an original OER for my listening and speaking course with a colleague. We worked together on that. Um, and I'm currently working on a foundations level um, resource as well, open resource to um, kind of be the textbook and then starting to dream and plan ahead for uh, levels two, three, and four in the series. Turning it over next to Sarah. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Kapp. I teach at Central Lakes College um, in Minnesota, and I've participated in a few different, I'm in the philosophy department, um, I've participated in a few different faculty support kind of projects for OER. Um, the first started with our local community college, and the result of that was that I um, worked with some of my students to create several different OER textbooks um, that we published on different sites online. I think it's in the chat, maybe. And then more recently, our state level, um, Minnesota State Colleges, they adopted the similar sort of faculty support model for creating new OERs. And in that project I just completed is the last link, which was supplemental materials for an OER textbook that was already um, published that I was using. Hey, Sarah, and I'm passing it over to Lori Beth. Hello, welcome. I am Lori Beth Larson. I am English reading and uh, global studies faculty at also at Central Lakes College in Minnesota. And um, I, uh, let's see, I started with um, a composition one, but um, didn't publish that. And then I also have uh, two reading, uh, developmental reading textbooks published an introduction to humanities textbook and a global studies textbook. So I'm just sharing a few of them. Thanks. Thanks, Lori Beth. All right, so for our audience, I have a bit of a poll for you. I'd like to know what challenges and barriers do you experience for faculty buy-in to adopt open educational resources into their teaching practice and courses? And please feel free to uh, put your answer in the chat or unmute get an idea of where everybody's sitting. So we're seeing a consistent theme around time and the amount of work to do it. Fatigue, some resistance to change. How does this count towards tenure and promotion? A lack of supplemental materials to go with the OER. Uh, worrying about UDL, great. Ah, overwhelming number of choices. Faculty would like to be compensated for the amount of work required to implement. Yeah.
Yeah, so some consistency around time again, and then the ancillaries. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for doing that. So as um, I work through the panelists and ask them questions, feel free if you a question comes to mind to pop it into the chat and uh, we'll introduce that your questions if if throughout the presentation, but if not, uh, at the end, there will be time for questions. So I'm going to start by asking our panelists a couple questions. Okay, so the first one, I think maybe I'll start with Larissa. Uh, when did you first learn about open educational resources and what motivated you to adopt, adapt, or create OER? I'm just going to stop sharing so that we can see each other well. Thanks, Kimberly. I can't actually remember when I first heard about OER, but I remember being drawn to the idea, really excited about it um, for a lot of reasons. It's primarily accessibility. Um, the cost of textbooks is quite prohibitive for many of our students, especially those who are coming to college on, on funding and grants and, and loans. And we were not using, like fully utilizing the resource that we had. And so I felt very uncomfortable asking students to pay for something that we weren't, they weren't getting the full value of. Um, relevance was a big draw for me. I couldn't find, um, a resource that really fit the course learning outcomes that we were teaching exactly. And so we already had a heavy reliance on faculty developed supplementary materials. We were already creating a lot of supplementary materials. So it just seemed like a natural thing to kind of compile them and replace um, the paid textbook. I think maybe my favorite reason is flexibility that we could design the resource to fit the ideal delivery rather than designing our delivery to fit available resources. Um, that spoke to my heart so much. Another reason, the licensing, when we were making all of these supplementary materials, it was really hard to keep track of whether they were all adhering to copyright um, laws or not. Um, and so this way we know Everything's been checked. We've gone through the open process. We've put the right licenses on and we know that everything is, is fair use. And uh, mostly I, I just got excited by the idea of being able to present my students and my colleagues with something that was perfect for our course, something that was designed, tailored for the needs and the outcomes and the content that we were teaching. Kim, you're muted. You think after all these years, I'd have that one down. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, so thank you for your answer. That was excellent. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to, to jump in and answer the same question. When did you first learn about OER and what motivated you to, to get involved? Sure. I'll just add the um, only other thing that um, Larissa didn't already mention, because I adopted for all the same reasons as she did. But I also had a textbook for a course I was assigned to teach um, as an adjunct faculty that I hated. And there wasn't any other good textbooks out there, even if we did want to pay a lot of money. And so it kind of motivated me through collaboration with our local OER contact, because we had sort of a, a group of faculty that were supporting each other in creating and adopting OERs on our campus. And so with her guidance um, and, the, and the group's sort of input, I, I did a class OER. So they created their own textbook. And that was very fun for me because it fit exactly into the kind of engaged project type learning I wanted my students to be doing in a leadership class as opposed to kind of reading somebody else's textbook and learning what other people think about the issues. So they did their own research and um, I loved that about it. And I also loved um, that I could combine textbooks. So I found I could find resources for free um, that were online that, that we could modify and kind of make a little better. That sounds like really exciting. Hopefully we're going to hear more about that co-construction with students as we get going. And so I'd like to turn the same question over to uh, Lori Beth. Hey, I, uh, I in about 2015 um, was in the, as the same group as Sarah actually. Um, and 
when I first heard about OER, I um, was highly attracted to it because of the freedom it offered me to connect with students right where they're at. And um, it, it took a little while. It, it, it took me the first time I, I uh, developed one. I felt a little bit uncomfortable because who am I to be an expert more than the textbook creators? But that went away. And then I was able to co-create um, with another faculty, uh, two reading, two reading um, OER. And then I co-created with a high school Spanish teacher uh, um, through our college in the schools program, a global studies OER. And then my, my favorite um, was to uh, pull our, our humanities class away from the Eurocentric uh, introduction to humanities and pulled it into a global, a global look at um, what makes us human. So I've had a lot of fun with it and have become so passionate about it that I um, am now the OER lead faculty on our campus running the, the same circles that we started in. Lori Bass. So lots about collaboration there that hopefully we can unpack as we get going. So we saw uh, from the poll that a lot of people, there were some common themes around barriers, right? Time, uh, the ancillaries, um, the equal parts of different OER. So I would like to ask, pose to the panelists, what barriers and challenges have you faced uh, with OER, you know, adoption and development? And so we'll start with Larissa again. Well, I'll go in the same order. Keep it simple. Okay. Uh, definitely time, that one, that ever, the most common response there, definitely time. And like, who pays for this work? How does this work get compensated? That's a, a big barrier. Um, for the courses that I, the kind of content I was looking for, I didn't really have the option to adopt. We couldn't find a lot of resources out there that would fit what we wanted. And so it takes more time to create from scratch than to adopt, of course. And so then we really are talking about like, how do we, how do we get the time for that? How do we fit that in? Um, I was very lucky to, I am very lucky to be in a department that supports OER and um, like my management is on board. And so time has been allotted uh, to some of us to do this work, but really I think slowly over time, taking what already is being used um, as supplementary material and then kind of tweaking it and, and, and massaging it and making it fit into something that can become an OER is a potential way that we can deal with that very real um, constraint, the time, the time barrier. So I think for me, the big one was the same thing, like this, this very thing, it's, it's time. How do we have time for this? especially given adoption is not an option. It has to be like creation. Thank you for that. I'll pass the same question over to Sarah. What barriers and challenges have you faced? Um, so in the process of looking at it, kind of all the same ones, it takes, I mean, honestly, I'm always reviewing textbooks to see what the next one is that I like best for my class. I think many, most faculty do that. So that part of it, but then when I didn't find exactly what I wanted, and there was a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here, it made it really seem jumbly for the students, right? So they, I just saw a post in the chat that is that kind of hit my biggest challenge was how to make it look like what they're used to and give them the same resources that they were used to, that they liked about the commercial texts. So they liked the bolded terms, they liked the definitions, they liked the, the quizzes and the reflection questions and all that. And none of that came with any of the textbooks that I was looking at. So that was a barrier. Um, and then the barrier specifically that our college worked to address, I think pretty well, was that some students still wanted a printed textbook and it was cost prohibitive for them to be printing out chapter after chapter of our readings. And so that, that was a barrier that we had to address as well, is how can we get a print version into the hands of students who want it that doesn't cost more than the, the original textbook that we were trying to get away from um, because it costs so much, that was part of the reason we adopted it. Um, and, and the student, I think student kind of buy-in, like they just didn't maybe love that, that approach totally, so. 
and passing that uh, same question over to Lori Beth. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had the same um, barriers. I think one of my very first barriers, and then um, every time I start a new one, um, I always feel that imposter syndrome. Who am I to be able to create something? Um, but then, you know, once I once I get over that, um, it flows along smoothly. And I've had students add bits and pieces as well. Um, and then there's always, there's always new ideas and new things that come out that, um, that I can add. So again, the freedom that eventually getting over the imposter syndrome and, uh, finding the time and, uh, the resources, they're, they're pretty decent challenges. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, with the next question, which is how did you ever overcome those challenges and why was it important to do so? I wonder if we can address um, Sign's uh, question in the chat about, um, you know, what happens when, what's the cost benefit to students who prefer a printed text as opposed to online resources? Because I think generally we're talking about e-text or online resources. So, and does, does printing come out last and how is this addressed? So if, if you have an answer to that, please feel free to include that into your question, uh, answer into how did you overcome the challenges that you faced and why was it important to do so? So Larissa, can I t turn this over to you first? I would like to address that. I don't have a, a clear answer, but um, at the beginning of every semester when I tell students they have this free online textbook that we've created, somebody always asks, can I get a print copy? And, um, Yes, there is a way through press books, but I tell them always to wait one week and then see if they still want it because the book is so highly interactive that a lot is lost if you were to access it in a print way. So if we're talking about the cost benefit, I think the benefit of having something that is interactive, um, even if that is, even if it's primarily text and then some like H5P comprehension questions or whatever, um, that I think that's such a big benefit that it might tip the scales. I understand not everybody can access and that is still an issue, but it's something to keep in mind that there is something that is only available in, in an e-text version. Um, in terms of my challenges, time was the big one. And so, like I think I mentioned, I tried to work with what I had already had. Um, every time I would develop something for the course, I would save it and add it to like the potential OER material. And so I'm, I'm still doing that in other areas. Um, and then being sure to maximize my time really carefully. So for example, turning off notifications on Tuesdays. This is my, this is my OER day. Sorry, um, I'll check at noon and four o'clock and that's the only time you'll hear from me. Um, trying to really maximize non-teaching time, like, like um, exam week or student success week or the times when there's not as much uh, demand on my time. And, um, and just really trying to stay motivated. And I did that by um, trying to demonstrate or collaborate or like test out things all the time. I would chat with a colleague like, oh, do you wanna see what I made this week? Or do you wanna, see, can, you, can you try this activity for me and see what you think? Just to keep myself excited. And then I'm looking for more opportunities to um, set aside time to keep working on it. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, and I'll turn the same uh, question over to uh, Sarah. Sure. So um, the first challenge, I guess, for me was um, not selecting the textbook so much, but just knowing what to do and how to do things. Like Larissa just mentioned, you can make your, you can add, and I don't know the code term, you said 5TPH5 something, right? That doesn't stick with me. But what I know that means is if I was told by people in this um, learning group that I belonged with, that we're all working on OER projects, the way that it was structured, we were able to share all the different projects people were doing. And one person shared the code for how in Pressbooks you can embed an interactive quiz. Um, and that you and I specifically had, um, I wanted it to be, it's not nested, but I wanted it to 
give, I wanted it to give them different sets of questions based on what they got wrong. Right. So it would be more tailored to their own learning. And that was, um, that was huge to learn that from the other people in my, thank you. Five, <laughs> H five, I still won't remember it, Lorraine, um, Lauren, but, um, but it was great to have that as an option and the solution that I got from other faculty. So I would say faculty support in a, in a sort of environment that was held for us by our administration. So you've got signed up for this and then you get paid for it. And so it was a stipend thing. And then everybody met during the week to share what they were working on and to get ideas. And I got great ideas from faculty. So that would help me overcome a lot of my barriers in creating and working with OER resources. Um, they, <laughs> to be honest, my biggest saving grace was AI. Um, there's absolutely no way I could have created all those quiz banks. And not that it was perfect or great, but I used the heck out of artificial intelligence to create quiz questions for my my textbooks, right? So it was a time saver for sure. Um, it also gave great suggestions for discussion and reflection. It, it's, you know, summarized. And then I kind of use that also to model to my students how they could interact with the textbook to get their own study resources from it. So that was a double win, I think. Um, and then the final issue, I guess, because I, I did find that most of my students don't even request to have the textbook printed anymore because I think our learning management system that our text, our books are uploaded in, I upload it as a PDF each week, a PDF file, and it reads it to them in our uh, learning management system. And they like that functionality. They also like the interactive nature where they hover over the words and they get definitions and all that stuff that the press books have in them. But the ones who do want a print copy, um, because it is crazy, it's like five or six cents a page for them to use their student print account on our campus. We've worked with our graphic design department, um, the program and the instructor there and the print shop. And they will actually, if I send them the PDF, they will arrange it, lay it out, and they will print it for the student and send it to our bookstore and then the student can actually charge it through financial aid as well. So we kind of worked out that solution at our college. Excellent. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. Uh, and over to you. Question, Lori Beth. Yeah, I I think I think uh, yeah the same as what uh, Sarah said. So we have uh, uh, learning circles both at the state level and at at our college, um, and at the college we had grants for the first few years to pay stipends for faculty to um, uh, create OER and adapt OER and the men's state um, as well. And so those are uh, group meetings, well-supported, um, both uh, financially and through each other sharing, a lot of, a lot of sharing. Um, the other thing was that um, I co-created the first four so I was working with another reading teacher. I was working with other composition teachers. Um, I was working again with the global studies teachers. So that is um, everybody contributing to a, an OER was a huge in minimizing the amount of time. Um, also, uh, we, I also embedded H5P in the books and so as students begin to use them the first two weeks um, I usually encourage them not to print it they have an option again like Sarah said uh, we have the option to print through our print shop but as they begin to use it and see so many interactive features within each chapter um, it just makes sense not to print it um, and so uh, eventually that doesn't become an issue um, but again, the, the freedom that I found using an OER and being able to adapt it as I go through each semester and adapt it to the students who are in front of me, um, just um, it actually uh, diminishes some of the time it takes rather than trying to figure out which parts of a textbook are going to relate to students. And that for the last 25 years has been a royal pain. So this is easier and it ends up taking less time. Awesome. I think we addressed, did we address everything? 
You did. I, I actually have like a follow up question. So I was I wanted to address what happens when people have limited access to technology or internet. So does everyone's campus offer free connection to internet? So does that help with that, or is there still barriers when students need to access tech with technology? Someone is asking the comment, not for commuter students. Does anyone want to comment on that? And I, I know during I know that during the pandemic, we have students sitting in the parking lot at Central Lakes College to access the Wi-Fi there. Um, but I think those primarily were students who lived in our campus uh, campus housing, and since since then, the Wi-Fi has much improved. So I don't think we have that much anymore. And I haven't found recently that students don't have access to Wi-Fi from home or coffee shop or um, on campus. That that hasn't been an issue for me the last few years. Even a public library would be a place to go. Yeah, I haven't really encountered that either. I've, I've encountered lots of issues with students knowing how to use the technology, but not 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 having access to it. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so uh, moving on to our next question. What advice would you give faculty new to o open and OER that are interested in adopting or developing OER? And I'll, I'll start with Larissa. Yeah, I would say do it. <laughs> there are no cons. There, I can't think of any, any negatives, not a single one. Um, it's It feels so good to know you're teaching from a resource that you really buy into. Um, there's such positive, I, I think in general, positive feedback from students. I'm sure there are some times when they, you know, would prefer something that they're more familiar with, but um, in general, I think it's only, only positive. I really love um, what you were talking about at the Minnesota, both Sarah and Lori, the uh, Minnesota, your school. What's the name of your school? Um, having those circles and like groups where you help each other, I think it's really important to create some buzz because I think OER is contagious. <laughs> and um, like, I just want to keep making more and more and more of them because it's so exciting. And, and the more you see somebody's Central Lakes College, thank you. The more you see somebody's work and the more you use it, the more you're excited to make your own. And so like, keep, keep talking about it, keep interacting with people who are working in OER. Um, and then if you need time, advocate for yourself, but you have to do it through speaking management's language. <laughs> so, so like, it is possible to get the time if you can convince the management to give you the time. And so that means finding some kind of metrics. They like metrics, right? They like marketing perspectives. So um, talking about uh, student um, uh, surveys. What am I talking about? I lost my word. Anyway, uh, satisfaction, satisfaction surveys. You want to um, talk about how it could really kind of um, put, put your organization on the map because somebody could find this in a press book somewhere or in another open resource. And then they're hearing about the school. Like there's, there's ways to go about it, um, kind of selling it to management. The benefits, there are, there are good benefits for the program. Student satisfaction, improved learning, increased like more tailored learning, getting better graduates, you're getting better outcomes, uh, more access to the, because there's not the same barriers for cost. So I think that's that would be my my advice for a new faculty, someone who's wanting to start. Like get excited about it by interacting with other people's OER and then speaking managerial language, uh, get some get some time set aside for you to do that. And if for those people who um, maybe might be part-time or not wouldn't necessarily um, be given so, uh, compensation for that. I'm, I'm hoping to speak with some part-time faculty when I start developing um, 
the next level two textbook and asking for people who might be willing to volunteer their time. And I think even, even that has such great benefits because these some of these people are trying to advance their careers. And so being part of something like the creation of an OER helps you stand out from the crowd, helps you um, have a little bit of a leg up in an interview if you're looking for a more permanent position. Um, yeah, so also doing it for the joy of it and for like Lori was saying, the ease, like it makes your job easier in the end to use a resource that you've made once rather than trying to scour the internet for the perfect thing. So that's a bit rambly, but those are my ideas. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, passing the same question over to uh, Sarah. So I was just answering this last question, the management phrases, like anything HLC is looking for, our, our accrediting body, that's what we, that's how I pitch it. I say it's student-centered, um, it's, culturally relevant, it's diverse, it's because it is, I mean, I make sure that mine are addressing all those things for um, my OERs. And that would be kind of my advice too, is to to start by putting your students first and teaching to them um, was the best thing I ever did. It started with that, the, like when I saw them, when I let them have the reins, when they created their own textbooks, they picked the topics that they thought they needed to know for learning about being a good leader. And I helped them a lot because like they didn't have background in any leadership philosophy or theory. So I was able to sort of clarify if they had questions, but it helped me see um, who they were and where they were and what they were interested in learning. And then from there to kind of keep them there is by looking at who I know my student body is or who lives in the area that I live in, what are their issues? And that made it more culturally relevant, which means they're gonna find themselves in that text and they're gonna do better. So you've got retention, persistence, all those like, whatever you wanna call those management speak to sell to your admin. This is why you need to pay us to do this. <laughs> That's a good one, Stephanie. Um, so that would be my, that would be that answer. I, um, other advice I have would be see how you can address the concern. Like if you have a list of your concerns, see how you could address those concerns. I usually do that by reaching out to others who like, I have that benefit of having this learning circle community around me in both places at the state level. And then at our local college that I get ideas from them. Um, and I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So like the print shop, for instance, was a good, a good example of that. They, we all realized we needed this option of printing and that when they were printing page by page out of our D2L learning management system, it was costing them way too much money. And so that was the solution that our campus came up with to address that issue. Um, so I like that reaching out to others, even if you can't convince admin to have these, these learning communities, I think that it's an excellent model and it helped me so much in the beginning. Um, and then I guess my only other thing was if you if you can't like there's there's also my my textbook that what for one class is full I use the full OER textbook that's online and it's also published through like I think it's called Broadview Press or something and they only charge twenty dollars for a print copy so they can I put that link in my D2L shell too so that they know that there's there's two options for you for this textbook I'll link readings interactive readings every week but you could also get it printed. I think that's really all. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, passing the same question over to Lori. Sure. I'm, I'm very similar, very similar. I would say making connections, um, making connections with other instructors who are um, teaching similar, similar courses. I would say making connections with people on campus, um, making connections. And I think uh, one of the primary things that I found most freeing in using um, OER was to actually take a hard look at the course, right? You have the course, you have the objectives, and then you adopt the textbook. And it all felt like it didn't quite fit. And so now um, it all fits. You can revise objectives, you can revise um, pedagogy, um, revise, um, uh, find much more diverse um, things for students to take a look at and to read, um, videos, embedding videos, embedding um, uh, activities where students are collaborating. So all of that is already developed when, um, and so making connections to me was the 
um, largest way, I think, or the primary way that that I um, overcame some of the challenges, as well as the challenge of having imposter syndrome. Um, you know, making connections. Other people are doing this. They're doing it well, and I can do it too. <laughs> That's great. We, we love that you're doing it. <laughs> um, there is a, sort of an ongoing um, question in the chat I just want to draw back in is around updating. Like what happens, how is updating your resources handled at each of your institutions? Because I think this person makes, um, sign makes a really good point is that, you know, if we go and print it and then something gets updated. So how is uh, OER updates handled at each of your institutions? I'm popping an extra question in there if, if you know and or if you have some thoughts about it. And really, I would invite you, any of you to answer that question. See, so it's not a pre-planned question. I can answer a little bit. I've I've updated a few a few of the OER, and I've been able to go through the Min State Learning Circles a second time for the same stipend to do some major updating. And so do they handle that in the initial edition or do they usually have a second edition? Because I, I think that the question is around, well, if I thought it looked like this and now there's been updates after I printed it. So do they usually handle that through a second edition? So again, I don't really encourage my students to print the textbooks. So when I update, it's just published as a new edition on our, our uh, Min State repository. to help uh, maybe alleviate that concern. Uh, um, I have seen dates. So the ones the if the authors of the textbooks I'm using, they will often put a date or revised or remixed and then the date will be on it. So I can I can share that with my students too that if they're purchasing it. Um, I use I use the CUNY. I haven't Joseph, I haven't used anything but press books, but I use OERs from people who have used the CUNY um software i can't answer that sorry uh, oh sorry go ahead Larissa. yeah this one of the the biggest benefits of oer is that we can be updating regularly and yeah the print version like if it's a major update then you'll have to reprint it but i feel like it's unlikely it would happen within the same course like within the same within that current offering of the course Right? It would be future students who would get an updated version. So um, like benefits for those who are using it in real time, but then like you could just reprint those few pages that were changed, could you not? Something to think about for sure mm -hmm. is that impact that when we're sharing something globally, um, perhaps making changes might may have. So thanks for answering that. I just wanted to pull that back in. I, I know uh, addressing the idea of different publishing platforms, I know in the past, um, this PD committee has had people come and talk about the different publishing platforms. And I think there are some plans in the work to do the same this uh, this season. So, so hold on to that thought. Okay, so the last, the big question, because often at um, these types of webinars, we have administrators in the audience. And so I would like to ask everyone and whoever would like to answer is fine. What advice do you have for administrators who are thinking, you know, I really do want to support faculty in OER adoption or development and like, how can I best do that? And then maybe I'll start with Larissa. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about somebody who already believes in it, who is already behind it? Let's go with that. I think anyone coming to these types <laughs> of webinars is probably at least interested and curious, if not already uh, sold. Yeah. Yeah. Faculty need time. They need the time and the space to be able to create, to create good resources. Um, and then if, if there's an administrator is really on board, they can work at their level to create some of these incredible things that we've been hearing about. So these, these circles, um, our college has uh, an entire team dedicated to supporting faculty making their OER and um, I gotta say my first book, the only one I've published, I did on my own with my colleague. My colleague and I did on our own together and it was a fantastic experience, but it was a very intense experience. The second one that I'm working on, now that there is a team dedicated to helping us plan and execute, it is so much 
faster. It is so much better. It is really incredible. So if there's an administrator who's really on board, you're the kind of people who can make some change at that level to kind of gather resources across departments or across the, the organization, um, kind of share those resources among the whole community. Terrific. And uh, Lori Beth or Sarah, would one of you want to jump in to answer this one? Okay, I um I agree with what Larissa said. It was a lot of work. Um, I uh, overestimate my abilities a lot of the time. So having a group around me, like my time abilities, much as having a group around me to support me was uh, was really essential. Um, and if administration can find a way to organize that, it also cuts down on like our work space for our learning circle groups contains all sorts of UDL materials, how to create a press book, how to like, how to do everything that all the how to's you could want in one place in our learning management system so that the questions that come up all the time for different faculty, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that helps them save a lot of time. They also facilitated then presentations. So um, by faculty uh, or companies, I think sometimes just talking about how to use their product with like how to do press books um, and then a bunch of videos all organized nicely. I know I could Google it, but honestly, when it's when it's laid out for me in the step by step week by week process, which is how our learning circles function, it's so much easier for me to undertake that activity and to stay with it because there was follow up as well, you know, like an accountability, like, did you get something done this week? And that way I was able to expedite the process and get it all done in a semester. So all those resources were done by the end of the semester. Um, so I would say if you could consider creating your own local OER work group with stipends, because that helps the buy in too. like if I'm getting paid for this, then I'm going to show up at all the things and I'm going to work ahead to getting this done. Um, and, and that way you can also share all those important resources with the faculty without um, burdening them too much, I guess, or making it harder. Awesome. Thank you for that. And probably could almost have a whole episode on the learning circles. It sounds really interesting to me. Um, and Lori, did you want to add any additional thoughts the, to that? Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add is um, to to take a serious look at the benefits. Um, you know, there is the cost benefits, it saves students money. Um, we have quite a few um, college in the schools programs, which means that the college is buying the textbooks. And so we save the, the college actually saves money. Um, but also the, um, the ability for students to take a look at um, their their learning materials immediately day one that's a huge factor um, additionally um, and this is kind of what my dissertation is on I think it allows faculty to take a really hard look or a really close look at what they're doing in the classroom pedagogically and um, then that just seems to automatically improve retention students show up they're more interested um, so I think there are an enormous amount of benefits that administrators can be aware of to support faculty in doing this. And then, yes, so faculty need to be supported. It's a lot of work. Awesome. Thank you for that. We've had some like really great comments and interactivity uh, happening in the chat, but I'd like to at this point invite anyone that would like to unmute and ask a question or provide a comment, or if you wish to do it in the chat, that would uh, be great too. Um, I have a question for Sarah, if you don't mind, about your learning circles. Is that organized through any particular uh, area of the college? Is it through like a center for teaching and learning or is it, um, part of an OER committee or how did, how does, how did that get created and how, who's sort of managing that? Or is it more ad hoc? I'm going to defer to our OER lead, who is Lori Beth actually at CLC right now. Um, she's doing the CLC one and then we have the state one, but she can talk more about that, I think. Good. Thank you. So we were, we were kind of lucky. Um, uh, Karen Pakula began 
our learning circles at Central Lakes College a number of years ago. She moved then to the state level and she runs um, state level uh, learning circles similarly. Um, and when when I began to to uh, help the or start the keep keep the OER steering committee and the um, open ed learning circles on our campus, we changed a little bit to a community of practice, but very similar ideas. Um, so we have yeah two of them. They began a number of years ago, and uh, yeah, did I answer that question? We meet once a month. Materials are all online. Right. Where does so, the funding stream kind of like, is it, where is it falling under? Like, it's not our CTL. It's not our Center for Teaching and Learning. Is it? I don't know that. It's a separate, it's a separate funding stream. So the first, I think, five years we had grant funded stipends. Um, then, you know, we applied for uh, college funding. So now we do have college funding to support a certain number of stipends every year that comes directly from the college. The Minnesota State um, comes from our uh, educational, uh, what's it called? NED. What's NED yeah. stand for? I've been Googling it. <laughs> yeah, I was okay. trying to find it when you yes. asked. I could probably find it, Cheryl, and email it to you if you want. Um, yeah, thank you. That's something I'm really interested in starting uh, statewide in Virginia. That would be exciting. Yeah, Karen Pakula would be the contact. I can see if I can find her contact information for you. She'd be happy to talk through the process she went through to move it from, to start it mm -hmm. on campus, move it to Min State, and then continue, we continued it on campus. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. And Joseph hit the the name. It stands for Network for Educational Development. Yeah. Which if you if it's under our like a course that you can kind of sign up for on our Minnesota State Colleges and Universities main webpage. Um Kim Lynch is the is the person who's in charge of this particular arm of it as well. So she would probably be a good resource for more of the like administrative structuring. How do we get this paid? How do we run this or set these up? Excellent. Would, would anyone else like to unmute and ask a question or provide a comment? Oh, perfect. And they're putting all the contact information in the chat. Awesome. So we have about uh, five minutes left. So just again, uh, any anything from our panelists, our audience that would any last minute sort of uh, comments or thoughts? We, it looks like we got some ideas for future webinars <laughs> around learning circles, <laughs> open circles. I think that sounds great. Oh, uh, Joseph, you've got your hand up. Please feel free to ask your question or make your comment. Sure. Um, I'd, uh, I'd I'd like to know if, if anybody's aware of any uh, use of AI, uh, some sort of a some sort of a comparison where you could take import the uh, contents and uh, subjects of a of a traditional textbook and have have some help from an I I E. I'm oh, sorry, some AI to align like several possible OERs that, that would that would do that because I'm thinking of like something I could bring into a faculty member teaching a certain class and say here's what you do in each of your modules and here's the the chapters of the textbook here's several OERs that could you know like supplement or do a better job that sort of thing but just to have something to, to lay out the smorgasbord for them rather than just going in cold and saying you should try to like either adopt or make an OER so I'll, I'll just I'll shut up and take an answer it might uh if I could just interject, it might be good to work with your library and learning services. If you have a library uh, help around copyright, because I think you would probably want to be careful about putting a copyright protected um, textbook, depending on what AI tool you are using. I don't know, does any one of our um, panelists want to jump in about that or any, I'm sure we have some copyright experts and library folk in the audience too. Any thoughts from 
anyone or anyone using a tool in a similar fashion? There was a website, I, I'm not remembering it right now, but there was someone who had updated a list of resources and where you could go. It wasn't AI though. Um, besides just like if you Google it and you were to get the OER Commons or OpenStax, or, I mean, you can go through those and individually collect by field or by program or whatever, they gather the textbooks for you. But there was also a woman Somewhere, I'm sure if I scrolled long enough, I'd find it. So if I find that, I can get that to you too, Joseph. Thanks. You know, there are a variety of webinars coming up that are addressing open ed and AI. I think I'm registered for a few. I don't necessarily have the links right now, but I know it's a hot topic. We're hoping to address that through CCC OER again in the spring. Maybe. Awesome. I, I don't know if we answered your question, Joseph, but uh, lots of things to consider for sure. Definitely. It sounds like it might be something I'll have to figure out how to build. <laughs> uh, I wonder that um, if a lot of love sites or open learning sites that are helping people build open don't have collections already made as well. I think that's what some people were alluding to as well. That might be a great place to start. All right. So as we are in our last few minutes, any last comments or questions? Great. Well, I think as you exit, there will be a survey um, asking about how your experience was today and Hopefully we will get to see you again at our next webinar. So please watch the listserv and the advertisements for those. Thank you for attending.